the world hangs on a thin thread. Yeah. And that is the psyche of man. Water. From ancient times, the symbol of the unconscious. The winds of time ruffle the face of the waters, but what sets the timeless deeps beneath into motion? As a child, Carl Gustav Jung already desired nothing more than to live by water, and for a lifetime he remained fascinated by the depths of the human soul and the riches which lie concealed in the unconscious. Jung believed that after the age of the fish, symbol for conflicts and lack of awareness, the new age of the conscious being would dawn, the age of Aquarius, the water man, the symbol of the self. Jung knew both worlds, the conscious and unconscious, outer and inner, the visible and the invisible. Carl Jung never shied away from the demonic power of the unconscious. He has even been called master of the underworld. But he himself said that he merely attempted to open himself to what came to him from within, and that his life is a history of the self-realization of the unconscious self. Is it true, as Jung thought, that this division between conscious and unconscious is present in all our lives? Or is his own case an extreme one? The Dutch-born American psychoanalyst and author Robert Bosnak gives this answer. I think that uh, the answer to the question whether Jung has a split personality or not tells more about the one who answers the question than about Jung. If I say that Jung had a split personality, it means I don't like Jung. If I say Jung did not have a split personality, it means that I can, could like Jung. So the, um, the question itself doesn't say very much about Jung. So I'll give my answer. And my answer comes from appreciating Jung. Um, I believe that Jung did not have a split personality, and I believe that um, we all have these personalities, one and two and three and four and five, for that matter. And um, where there is uh, one personality that's involved with the exterior world, that is your presentation to the outer world, that is the way that you look to other people, that's the way that other people see you, which Jung later came to call the persona. And then there is this, this part of yourself that is involved with the depth of your being, and that, um, that is involved with questions of spirit and soul and with uh, the intimacies of your heart.
and that would be personality number two. So I do not think at all that Jung is a split personality. Jung's life revolved around the search for the center, the self, the essence which can allow the personality as a whole to blossom forth. The symbol for the totality of the person is the mandala, and Jung painted many of these during his life. They were, as he called this one, his window onto eternity. Drawing mandalas also aided him in re-establishing contact with himself during times of crisis. He thus breathed new life into an ancient symbol, a symbol which is not only meaningful for psychoanalysts, but also for scientists, such as the American physicist and astronomer Victor Mansfield. Primarily, as I understand, the mandala is usually a symbol of the self, of his unity of the opposites. And very often Jung would found, and I find this too in my own personal life, when the psyche is under enormous stress and you're being pulled apart by the opposites, the uh, dream life might compensate with a, um, with a powerful uh, expression of some symbol of wholeness of the mandala. And uh, that's oftentimes experienced as an enormous grace, is the only word I, I know how to use, because you don't feel like you're just at the mercy of uh, all the gods ripping you in different parts, but that there's some guiding principle of wholeness in you, what Jung would call the self, which is uh, in some ways in the background attempting to bring a certain kind of wholeness, maybe redirect you into a whole different level. And uh, in my own life, I've been actually, you know, um, pulled in, in terms of the scientific uh, world in, in certain directions and my own psychological and developmental needs in other directions. And so when I write about psychology and physics, it's not merely an intellectual um, endeavor, but it's also an attempt at bringing a certain unity to my own life. So in some ways I'm working on my own mandala uh, to try and unify the opposites in me. This avenue leads to the house in the Swiss village of Kuznacht, where Jung lived and worked for the greater part of his life, and where he died in 1961, shortly before his 86th birthday. Anyone wishing to enter the house must pass under the Latin inscription above the door. Called or not called, God will be present. Shortly after his death, the American psychoanalyst and writer June Singer came to pay her last respects to Carl Jung. She regards her experience after she entered the house where he lay in state as an initiation. I remember walking up the uh, long walk to the imposing mansion at um, Kusnach where he lived, and one of the members of the family greeted me and said, would you like to go upstairs? And I said yes. And I thought I would be escorted, but no, I was allowed to go up all by myself. And I, f in fear and trembling, walked up those steps and into the main hall. And there is a doorway, open an open door. And the room was dark, and there were candles fl flickering there. And I walked and stood in the doorway. And there I saw young lying on the bed in a white nightgown, an old-fashioned white nightgown such as one might have expected of Dr. Faust himself, and the flickering light of the two tall candles on either side of the bed. And this imposing figure that I had heard talked about so many times was not there in that bed. It was a frail old man. But the power was in that room. I really felt that that marvelous that spirit still present and I stood there for a while and perhaps that's when I became initiated as a young man and then I came down and I it was years before I could talk about that to anyone Water, the symbol of the unconscious. In the words of the Chinese sage Lao Tzu, it flows to those places disdained by man. 
Jung followed the course of the deeper currents and was in consequence both revered and reviled. Against his will, he even became the father of a new tradition, the Jungian school, but he himself was a man of humility. When people say I am wise or a sage, I cannot accept it. A man once dipped a hatful of water from a stream. What did that amount to? To some extent, I perceive the processes going on in the background, and that gives me an inner certainty. I do not know what started me off perceiving the stream of life. Perhaps it was my early dreams. Knowledge of processes in the background shape my relationship to the world early in life. As a child, I felt myself to be alone, as I am still, because I know things and must hint at things which others, for the most part, do not want to know. The first four years of Jung's life were spent in the little village of Laufen, close to the Schaffhausen waterfall. His father was the minister of a community which still more than a hundred years later attends its church. <laughs> Jung later remembered with affection this farmer, who was both gravedigger and sexton of the old church. For his father, an irritable man, Jung felt more compassion than anything else. Did his father really believe in the divine mercy which he preached? Early on, the child took the part of his mother, a warm and gifted woman. He felt a kinship with her ability to see behind superficial reality. His parents' marriage, Jung said later, was not a joyous partnership, but rather a long test of patience beset by many difficulties.
Vegas in the form of a shocking dream which will continue to preoccupy him for the rest of his life. In my dream, I was in the meadow behind the vicarage where I often played. Suddenly, my attention was drawn by a place in the earth where I felt there must be something beneath. I ran forward curiously. There was an entrance covered by a green curtain. I pushed it aside and saw a stone stairway leading downwards into the dark. Hesitantly and fearfully, I descended. At the bottom, I saw before me in the dim light a rectangular chamber with an arch ceiling. The floor was laid with flagstones, and in the center, a red carpet ran from the entrance to a low dais, bathed in vague light. On this dais, stood a wonderfully rich golden throne which seemed to be connected by roots to the depths of the earth and something was standing on the dais. At first, I thought it was a tree trunk without leaves or branches, but the thing on the golden throne turned out to be an immense monstrosity towering high into the arches above the chamber. It was bathed in soft rays of light which seemed to come from nowhere. Then I saw something curious. The thing was made of skin and naked flesh, and on the very top was a single eye staring motionlessly upwards. At that moment, I heard my mother's voice. She called out, yes, look well at him. That is the man-eater. I woke with a start, sweating and scared to death. Who was it then who disturbed an innocent childhood with dark suspicions and deep wisdom? Who else but that alien guest who came both from above and from below? Through this childhood dream, I was initiated into the secrets of the earth, and in this, my spiritual life found its unconscious beginnings. How is it possible for such a young child to dream about things which cannot rationally be explained away as old memories? Robert Bosnak. I believe that the imagination has a structure. The imagination is not without structure. The un uh, unconscious is not without structure. There are proclivities. There are proclivities to imagine things in certain ways. And um, in many cultures, there are um, all kinds of images that come up that you can also find in other cultures. The phallus, for instance, you can find in many different cultures. You can find it in, in Egyptian culture. You can find it in Greek culture. You can find it in Indian culture. Um, in many different places, the same image comes up. So there is some form of, um, of structure to the imagination, and Jung calls that an archetypal structure. And that structure of the imagination brings forth certain images with a certain amount of regularity, and therefore it is not necessary as an individual to already have experienced these images. We must remember that Jung was male. I'm not sure that a woman would have ever had that kind of a dream. But since males have been the ones who have, uh, at least in the Judeo-Christian culture, formed the, uh, the God concept, or at least given representations to it, uh, it seems that the male aspect of God is much more evident. And the phallus dream shows that male aspect in all its uh, power, its wonder, and its terror. Because I think that um, the phallus is all that for men and for women.
As it is with these great trees, thousands of years old, so it is also with the unconscious, according to Jung, the result of a very long process of growth. Its content stems from humankind's primal psychic experiences. These are present in all of us, just as beneath the surface of the Earth, every phase of her development lies geologically recorded. Jung's depth psychology is the geology of the human soul. This sexual symbolism, according to Jung, alludes to human psychic totality, to the In spite of our pride in ruling over nature, we are still her victims, Jung writes. We have not even learned how to rule our own nature. Carl Jung about this in 1957. The world hangs on a thin thread, and that is the psyche of man. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? See? And uh, so you see, it is, it is demonstrated to us in our days what, what the power of the psyche is of man. How important it is to know something about it, but we know nothing about it. No, nobody would, uh, would give credit to, to the idea that uh, the psychical uh, uh, processes of the ordinary man have any importance whatever. One thinks, oh, we have just what he has in his head, it is all from his surrounding, he's taught such and such a thing, believes such and such a thing. And particularly if he's well housed and well fed, then he has no ideas at all. Yeah. That, that's the great mistake. Yeah. Because he is just that as which he is born, and he's not born as Tabula Rasa, but, but as, as a reality. Carl Jung's belief was that a lack of awareness leaves us prey to our own psychic underworld. There are no longer gods we can call on for aid, because in our arrogance we have driven them out of the forests, rivers and mountains. We have thus lost contact both with nature and with ourselves, and what we have dubbed progress has caused a very great deal of suffering. I believe that it is very dangerous to believe that um, we can end suffering. Because uh, what I saw in, uh, in uh, political work that I've done is that people believe that you can end, for instance, world hunger. And you work and you work and you work and you work and after 10 years there's still world hunger. So if you think that you can eliminate everything in a short period of time or that you can eliminate anything at all, then you will burn out and you can no longer work on it. If there is a possibility to uh, keep on working with this tragic knowledge that there is suffering in the world and that you can work on the suffering and that you can lessen the suffering, but that you cannot entirely eliminate the suffering, then you can do it for your whole life, which I think is important. These gigantic problems that we're faced with, we will be faced with for the rest of our lives and we have to be involved in them in the same way that we brush our teeth in, teeth in the morning. We have to be involved uh, with the world, not hoping to eliminate suffering from the world, maybe to ameliorate suffering, I would hope so, but knowing that the work has to be done anyway.
if you look around and you ask yourself, what does the modern um, government, the modern person, really invest themselves in, let's say, in terms of uh, dollars and cents or emotional energy and so on, you see that the current god is the god of science and technology. Where does the United States, for example, put its money? Star Wars, superconductors, super colliders, and so on. Uh, no one's building Chartres anymore. No one is building the pyramids. Uh, so just on that level, it's quite clear, oh, let's say, which is the current religion. Even though most people wouldn't like to think of science and technology as a religion, it has that kind of commitment from the populace. It has that kind of devotion. These total destructions where we have the capacity to destroy everything in the world must have a very profound influence on the world and therefore on ourselves. And so we have to find new images of the self. We have to find new ideas of the self. We have to look at art again and find images of self there. We have to recreate ourselves. The political situation and the devilish triumphs of science shake us with dark forebodings. We stand empty-handed, bewildered, and perplexed, and cannot even get it into our heads that no myth will now come to our aid, although we have such urgent need of one. In our time, the collective ideal is still so essential as an intermediate stage on the road to becoming whole that many see it as the final goal. But what our world lacks is psychic and inspired cohesion. And no trades union, no interest group, no political party or state will ever be a substitute for this. Because every process of becoming whole must begin somewhere. It will be the individual who will experience it and bring it into being. He or she is thus taking a risk, for the great herd knows no doubt, and the greater the mass, the greater the truth, but also, therefore, the greater the catastrophe. This reminds me of a notion in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, the so-called divine pride, and that goes something like this. Uh, after many years of hard training, a, uh, a monk will develop a certain level of concentration, his ability to hold his mind steadily on one thought or one image. And at that stage, they then will um, be given the exercise of imagining a deity, uh, one of the gods in the Tibetan pantheon. Now, this is a very hard job, and only a person who has really developed mental skills can, can hold the image steadily in mind. But once that image is actually concretized and held with a certain kind of fixity and vividness, uh, it's an overwhelming experience. And the natural thing is to develop a kind of divine pride that I have created this God. I am the master of this deity. And of course, that's disaster. However, the safeguard for that in the Tibetan tradition is this deep appreciation of the emptiness, of the lack of independent existence of both the deity and the person meditating. Unfortunately, in the West, we don't have such a safeguard. When Oppenheimer and his crew builds the atomic bomb, uh, they think that they have um, touched the deepest secrets in nature, and indeed they have. And there's a certain kind of divine pride that is um, excited there. And unfortunately, most of us who are swept up in this kind of power drive do not have the kind of safeguards that the monastic tradition has developed over years. Jung always emphasized that the individuation process is not just um, something that happens uh, by myself in my little room looking at my navel. No, 
the individuation process happens in interactions between an I and a thou, in the intimacy between people, but also in the way that we look at the world and the way that we work on the world. Because the world being in a constant state of flux has these images under it that, try, that are trying to emerge and that we have to study. Um, we, have to, we have to begin to understand that the world is um, uh, created by the expectations that we have of other people. Uh, you can see this in, uh, for instance, when the Cold War was still going on, um, how uh, the Americans thought of the Russians as the empire of evil and the Russians vice versa. And um, uh, these are all archetypal images that are very important in pol politics. And so if we begin to understand more that at the depth of the psyche, there are these archetypal images going on, moving us all the time, changing us all the time, and we are unaware of it, then we project it onto others, and then we begin to attack others for things that happen to us. I can, can give you an example from my own practice, for instance, um, where there is a woman... Uh, who um, one, these days one would call a borderline case, um, but whatever you call it is not important. Uh, but anyway, her self is, is in a state of such disarray and such um, uh, explosion and so much all over the place. There's so much destruction going on in herself, so much destruction in the depth of her soul, that she sees herself, her self-image, as entirely innocent, entirely whole, very peaceful, and all these other mean people are doing this to me and they're doing that to me and look, they're doing this to me. And she comes to me with stories of how people mistreat her all the time. And that is uh, an attempt to compensate for, uh, for this uh, state of, uh, of disarray and destruction that she is in. Now, just imagine that this happens to a country that a country does not want to see its own sense of destruction, well, then it will see it in others and will constantly say, look, they're doing this to us, so we have to throw a bomb on them. The process of becoming whole, as meant by Jung, is symbolized by the mandala, the Hindu word for magical center. It is an archetypal image from the unconscious, and its existence can be traced far back through the centuries. Mandalas are, as this rose window in Basel Cathedral shows, representations of the divine self. They are found in the West as well as the East. In ancient times, mandalas were used to rediscover the meaning and order of life. The protecting and enclosing circle symbolizes wholeness, while the rectangular form represents its realization. The motif of two interlocking triangles also frequently appears. In psychology, this mandala refers to the union of opposites, the great theme of Jung's life and work. Around 1930, Jung treated a young woman from America who was in a crisis caused by her intellect blocking her emotions. With the aid of the guided fantasy method developed by Jung, Miss X, as he referred to her, portrayed her unconscious emotions in a series of mandalas. The first drawing shows how her lower body is imprisoned within a boulder. The environment? A beach with egg-shaped boulders. But the egg is a symbol for new life and demonstrates that the unconscious self has chosen for self-realization or individuation. In the second drawing, the boulders are mostly round. The flash of lightning reveals that dramatic change is imminent. For the first time, a drawing, the third, is enclosed by a circle 
Jung comments that according to ancient traditions, the soul has a spherical shape, and the patient tells him that with this mandala, an immense process of inner activity has begun. Within the sphere, a nucleus has formed, the stylized image of the female sex organs being fertilized by a black snake. In the next drawing, the black snake has left the center. Clearly, the psyche has as yet not accepted the shadow side. A short time later, the union of opposites is achieved. The darkness of the snake is accepted into the center. Confrontation with the shadow has come, but it has not yet been integrated. The next phase shows the integration with the shadow. High in the mandala float three white birds against a dark background, and beneath, a grey he-goat is drawn on a pale ground. White cannot be without black, nor the devil without the sacred. And in the centre, the soul flower, within which the snake is now incorporated, crowned by the arc of a half-rainbow. On her return to New York, her first act is to draw a mandala to compensate for the disturbing influence of the great city. At the top, the union of opposites is depicted in the fire of love between man and woman. The next mandala hangs above the glass and concrete of Manhattan. Blue snakes thrust into red flesh, emotion and reason flow together. And finally, this mandala, forming the radiant high point in Miss X's process of individuation. Individuation embodies the answer to the great question of our time. How can our forward-rushing scientific and technological thinking be reunited with the unconscious? This problem cannot be solved collectively for the mass does not change unless the individual changes. In 1895, at the age of 20, Jung begins his studies at the University of Basel. Five years later, he qualifies as a physician and chooses definitively for the practice of psychiatry. Two years more and he achieves his doctorate with a thesis on occult phenomena. Spiritualist seances with his cousin Helene Preiswerk allowed Jung to witness how spirits can be invoked from the kingdom of the dead. The high point of one spiritualist evening was the moment that Helene, in a trance, gave him a mandala through his pen as he would describe it later. It was these of his experiments which led to the writing of Jung's doctoral thesis. The year 1900. The capital cities of Europe buzz with the excitement of the birth of a new century. 1900 brings the death of the man who announced the death of God, Friedrich Nietzsche. It also brings Max Planck's quantum theory to break through the old mechanistic view of the world and to contribute to Jung's later concept of synchronicity. And in Vienna that same year, a future physicist and Nobel Prize winner is born. Several decades later, this man, Wolfgang Pauli, will consult Jung about his psychological problems, the starting point of a remarkable collaboration. And finally, 1900 sees the publication by a Viennese psychiatrist whom Jung has not yet met of a book on dreams, Traumdeutung. The name, Sigmund Freud. In those days, the psychologically disturbed was seen as suffering from an incurable brain disorder. The patient's psyche was not a subject for examination. Jung had other ideas about this. 
In the Buchholzli Psychiatric Clinic near Zurich, in the same year of 1900, Jung takes on his first position as a psychiatrist. He is 25 years old. With my work at Berg Horsley, life took on an undivided reality. It was an entry into the monastery of the world, a submission to the vow to believe only in what was probable, average, commonplace, barren of meaning, to renounce everything strange and significant, and to reduce anything extraordinary to the level of the banal. Through my work with the patients, I realize that paranoid ideas and hallucinations contain a germ of meaning, that a general psychology of the personality lies concealed within psychosis, and that even here we encounter the old human conflicts. Even with apparently dull or apathetic patients, there is more going on in their minds than there seems to be. At bottom, we discover nothing new and unknown in the mentally ill. Rather, we encounter the substratum of our own natures. This insight was for me at that time an overwhelming emotional experience. Jung suspected that all the spirits called up by his cousin Helene were in fact independent personalities within the medium herself, and at Burgholzli he tested these suspicions through the so-called association experiment. Electric pulses from the body set a mirror in motion which makes visible the hidden emotions of the subject through his or her associations with a stimulus word. Jung's research did indeed demonstrate the existence of the unconscious. As everyone knows, the unconscious can show itself, sometimes painfully through mistakes or slips of the tongue. But the concept that independent psychic complexes were at work in this was diametrically opposed to the idea that the unconscious consisted of repressed traumatic experiences, as Freud thought. Freud and Jung were very much alike in their exploration of the unconscious and their willingness to pioneer in this field that had not been touched before by psychologists. But the difference was in the way that they viewed the unconscious and the ego's relation to it. Uh, when we say ego, Freud and Jung didn't use that word. They used the word I. So they were concerned, both of them, in how I, the person that I myself think of as, as who I am, relates to this mysterious part of me that isn't conscious, that isn't part of my thought. Uh, for Freud, this part came from consciousness, by and large. It was a repository of all the repressions of the things that my parents told me that I didn't want to hear, the things that I was afraid to voice, the fears that I had that I wouldn't uh, admit even to myself, all those dark, um, inexpressible aspects of my life. Uh, were relegated to the unconscious. They're either forgotten, not noticed, or repressed, that is, unconsciously forgotten. Jung didn't have any disagreement with that. It was all there. But Jung, unlike Freud, saw the unconscious as already a teeming mass, of, like the soil full of organisms. The unconscious for Jung was the, re the vessel that held the residue not only of the individual human psyche, but of the psyche of humankind. During this period of adventurous exploration of the unconscious, Jung enters into two relationships which are to be of the greatest importance to him. In 1903, he marries Emma Rauschenbach, and in 1907 comes his first meeting with Sigmund Freud, whose controversial psychoanalysis he has already openly defended, and who will, from that first meeting, consider Carl Jung as the son who will one day wear his mantle. As early as 1913, however, this relationship comes to a dramatic end. 
The breaking point is Jung's book Wandlungen und Symbole der Libido. For Freud, libido is strictly limited to sexuality, but Jung expands it to general psychic energy or life energy. I can still recall vividly how Freud said to me, my dear Jung, promise me never to abandon the sexual theory. That is the most important thing of all. You see, we must make a dogma of it, an unshakable bulwark. He said this to me with great emotion, in the tone of a father saying, promise me this one thing, my dear son, that you will go to church every Sunday. In some astonishment, I asked him, a bulwark against what? To which he replied, against the black tide of mud of occultism. I think that you can best see the phallus in the first place as a sexual symbol, the male sexual symbol. So then it has something to do with male energy and um, sexual energy, so energy that comes out of the body up and presses itself out, is independent. I mean, you get erections uh, without doing anything for it, without having any control over it, which is often the pleasure and the awful thing about erections. And um, so it presses itself up, in, in the case of Jung, and, and this, all this sexual, natural, instinctual energy is pushed up and then with the dream it ends up in this eye that looks up at, at the sky. And I think that that would mean for Jung that this, this libido, this, this force of nature is pushing itself up and trying to reach towards consciousness. Near the end of his life, Jung writes the following about that period. When I started work on the last chapter of my book, Wandlungen und Symbole der Libido, I knew it would cost me my friendship with Freud. I was seen as a mystic, and that was the end of the matter. The effect on Jung was very strong, so his whole reality was shook up, and um, he had to find his own myth, and uh, he could no longer just take over Freud's mythology. He had to go and find his own mythology, his own way of interpreting the world. So, since he didn't have anything to go by, he decided to uh, to trust the images that would come up and uh, begin some form of interaction with those images. And he did that by uh, sitting on the beach and playing. For Carl Jung, a close relationship with water now became a necessity of life. He was to give concrete form to his own individuation process by building this house in Bollingen beside Lake Zurich. 
he painted the interior walls with figures from his dreams and fantasies, such as this Philemon, whose mate, the blind Salome, does not yet appear. It was only later that Jung was to realize the importance of the female principle, the anima, in the man. For Jung, it was a great discovery because in his society, the qualities that we associate with the feminine were not acceptable for a man to have. And so uh, they took on a very numinous quality, a very unconscious, very powerful quality, because whenever we repress or deny something within ourselves, it gains this tremendous power, uh, like monsters in the closet that children have, you know. The, the more uh, they try not to see them, the, more, the larger they get. And uh, so with Jung's concept of the feminine, Around this time, married already for some years to Emma Rauschenbach, Jung began a relationship with a young woman who would influence him greatly, Tony Wolf. She it was who made him aware for the first time of his feminine side, the anima. The union of opposites continued to be Jung's central preoccupation, a theme which, to his surprise, turned out to have its roots in the old science or art of alchemy, which at first he had dismissed out of hand as nonsense. Another woman, still young at that time, collaborated with Jung in the study of Gnostic and alchemical text, Marie-Louise von Franz, the archaeologist. He thus unavoidably fell under the spell of the inner gold, the aspiration of the alchemist since ancient times. Jung's academic development was now definitively linked with his own process of individuation. I was being compelled to go through this process of the unconscious. I had to let myself be carried along by the current without a notion of where it would lead me. When I began drawing the mandalas, however, I saw that everything, all the paths I had been following and the steps I had taken, were leading back to a single point, namely to the midpoint. The mandala is the center, the exponent of all paths, and the path itself to individuation. I knew that in finding the mandala as an expression of the self I had attained for me the ultimate. You do not attain the light by imagining light, but through awareness of darkness. This is distasteful and therefore unpopular. The years when I was pursuing my inner images were the most important in my life. It all began then. The later details are only clarifications of the material that burst forth from my unconscious. From then on, my life belonged to the generality. Philemon and other figures of my fantasies brought home to me the crucial insight that there are things in the psyche which I do not generate, but which generate themselves and have their own life. Psychologically, Philemon represented superior insight. He was the archetype of the old wise man, and in Bollingham he lives. From the beginning, I had conceived my voluntary confrontation with the unconscious as a scientific experiment which I myself was conducting. Now I might equally well say that the experiment was being conducted on me. For Carl Jung, the gateway to inner perception was now open, and he began to see the hidden links between psyche and matter. An example. 
When he had completed the painting of the mandala, the golden castle, and wondered why it appeared so Chinese, Jung received from the sinologist Richard Wilhelm the manuscript of a Chinese alchemical text entitled Das Geheimnis der Goldenen Blüte, The Secret of the Golden Flower. Such an unexpected apparent coincidence of events in the world of spirit and the world of matter, Jung termed synchronicity, a phenomenon which even then was already recognized in the sphere of modern physics. Is there indeed some relationship between the colliding particles in an accelerator and the world of spirit, as suggested in Jung's later hypothesis? In classical physics, there's a world of atoms and fields, and then there's the mental world of the physicist, and uh, the great classical masters never worried about how to put these two together. They took it for granted that the material world was the domain that physics studied, and they never tried to address the problem how such two very different principles could ever be related. How could mind know matter? And modern physics has brought that problem up in a particularly intense way. And it's not to say that they have solved the problem, but they certainly have to continuously circle back to the importance of trying to understand how it is that matter is known by, uh, let's say, the scientist. I don't think it's fair to say that we now are developing uh, a theory in physics which ties the psyche intimately to matter. No, that's, that's going too far. I mean, some people would say that, but I think the majority of physicists would, would not agree with that. What we have shown, however, though, in a series of very beautiful theoretical and experimental studies, is that independent of the present formulation of quantum mechanics, we know that nature has uh, a kind of interdependence at the atomic level that is impossible to understand if you believe in independently existent particles. And of course Jung made a very big point out of it and he got a lot of scorn from people too to say that you know there's uh, intimate connections between what goes on in the outer world and what goes on in your inner world. Even if 30 spokes are brought together in the hub, in what is not there lies the usefulness of things. Even if clay is brought together as a pot, in what is not there lies the usefulness of the pot. Even where doors and windows are cut out to build a house, in what is not there lies the usefulness of the house. Thus, taking advantage of what is, one makes use of what is not. In words such as these, from the Chinese sage Lao Tzu, Carl Jung recognized himself. When Lao Tzu says, all are clear, I alone am clouded, he is expressing what I now feel in advanced old age. The archetype of the old man who has seen enough is eternally true. <laughs> 